Good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth weekend of Cine Club Pelicula. Uh, today we are discussing the film La Buena Estrella by Ricardo Franco. And um, it stars Antonio Resines, Maribel Verdú, and Jordi Moya, and was a big hit in Spain in the 1990s. Joining us this weekend for our Cine Club Pelicula are. Um, Actress and um, now moving towards the, the 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 production side with plans to do both. Anika Dolonios, hi. Hi, Jessica. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We know Anika from from films like Pisai and Apocalypse Child, and currently she is working behind the scenes on OTJ two. Yep. I'm also doing and, um, a. Also currently in production for a film for Cine Filipino this year, which is on hold because of the, the pandemic, I guess. But um, yeah, but you know, we have to believe that we're going to go back to making movies. Definitely. Yes. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Thanks wood. for joining us. Yeah, and then um, with us also is Monster Jimenez, director whose work spans. Um, documentaries like Kano and feature films like Apocalypse Child, Hello Monster. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, it's still afternoon. I myself have lost all sense of time. <laughs> yes, that's me also. Hello. Yes, and um, the Monster is also one of the people behind the forthcoming Online now, right? Online festival, the Ang Docu, where you will show Filipino-made documentaries. Yes, uh, it's actually a big deal because it's supposed to span since the beginning of time, since we started making documentary films. So if you can imagine, that's the first documentary film in the 1900s up to today. I hear a cat. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I am very sensitive to cat sounds because my cat sometimes interrupt me. So, That's hi to the cat. And of course, <laughs> joining us from Lisbon is the Philippine ambassador to Portugal, Ambassador Celia Feria. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi, Jessica. I think we agreed to call me Cookie. Yes, uh, we, we have agreed to call the ambassador Cookie. So, um, this is the first um, cine club I have done where the guests include Cookie and Monster. Yes. So, so cool. it's, it's very Pinoy. <laughs> okay, good morning from yes. this one, and I'm very happy to be here. So I, I, I thank um, Jose and the Instituto Cervantes and the Spanish Embassy for remembering me. Um, I have a long story with, uh, with Spain, and um, it's, uh, you know, even if I'm ambassador to Portugal, I... Um, have so much fond memories of my long stay in Spain, and maybe later on we can talk about that. Yes, and that will that will really be interesting when we um, contextualize the movie that we're going to discuss because um, it it was it's set in the period when you yourself were living in Spain, so um, that should be that should be particularly insightful. And also, um, I must mention that Cookie is also. Uh, the organizer of a Filipino film festival in Portugal. Um, yes. will, is, is that going to be an ongoing um, annual activity? Well, you know, we, we, before I got here in May of uh, 2017, and when I got here, the idea was really to promote more of the Philippines. Now, Philippines, in spite of what the embassy is doing, you know, we've already mainstream in a lot of the film festivals in Portugal. One is the Port, uh, Fantas Porto Film Festival in Porto, which in, in, uh, they go directly to directors in the Philippines. And so when I got here, we were already participating in those kinds of film festivals. And then I was also surprised to see a lot of Philippine films in, in, in a lot of the, there was a horror film festival, there was all kinds of film festivals, and there was a lot of Philippine films. And that made me really proud that you know, the embassy doesn't have to do anything because our films are out there. But what I did, Jessica, last year was I worked with the Cinemateca Portuguesa, which is the film, you know, the Cinemateca here in Portugal. 
And the idea was to have mm -hmm. an institutional relationship between the FDCP and the Cinemateca so that we could have this uh, long-standing official relationship with, uh, with, with Portugal in terms of film. And so we did the first Filipino retrospective film festival and it was held last uh, November. Um, the interesting thing is the Cinemateca is just across the street from the embassy. So every day I see the Cinemateca. And so for that three weeks in Lisbon, when the Philippine banner, uh, it was a film taken from Pepe Diocno's, one of Pepe Diocno's film that was entered in the, in the film festival, because we tried to show the three golden eras of Philippine film, well, you know, in three weeks and through 15 films, we, we chose it together with the Cinemateca. So the pride uh, in having something like seeing that um, banner uh, in the facade of the Cinemateca, I, I think it brought so much pride um, to, to the Filipinos because then we became mainstream uh, and working with the Cinemateca has brought us closer <laughs> to the film industry here in, in, in Portugal. Yes, and uh, uh, an excellent project, which I hope will continue when um, life goes back to right. normal, <laughs> whatever that is. Okay, so this week we are discussing the film La Buena Estrella by Ricardo Franco. Ricardo Franco, the filmmaker, had a fairly brief but prolific career in Spanish cinema. Unfortunately, shortly after um, La Buena Estrella, he, he died of an illness. But um, he's remembered to this day as the director of films like La Buena Estrella, which won five Goya Awards, uh, basically a sweep of their major award giving, uh, of their major, uh, what do you call it, For, of their major award giving body. And uh, it also competed at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, on the personal side, Franco is the son of the filmmaker Jess Franco whom um, film geeks will know as the purveyor of sex horror movies back in the 60s and 70s. And he is also a cousin to novelist Javier Marias, who is one of the um, most important novelists working in Spain today. Um, one of his works, as I mentioned, is an adaptation of the novel Pascual Duarte by Camilo José Sela. And uh, if you're interested in looking up Pascual Duarte, it's available in a Tagalog translation by Salvador Malik. Anyway, so um, uh, La Buena Estrella is the story of a love triangle. It's technically a melodrama, so although it, um, it veers away from a lot of the familiar tropes of melodrama. So I'd like to start by asking um, our, the actor on our panel, Annika, what she thought of the film, which, which has been roundly praised for the acting of the performers. Annika? Um, so, you know, I, I came into watching the film, I watched it last night and I didn't, I didn't look for a trailer, I didn't read any, I came in blind. You know, I just clicked the link and I said, let's go, let's watch. And so I didn't know what to expect, but I loved it. I, I, I thought it was a really good movie and the performances were pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. It, it was, you know, it was funny because there were certain moments where I was wondering if it was going overboard, maybe being, getting a little too melodramatic, but then it, 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 it didn't. It didn't go too much. I just assumed that it was just it's there. Uh, it was a Spanish thing, kind of like the the way that we are as Filipinos. We're very passionate and and expressive like that. So I figured, you know, that was just a part of it, a, a way that they are. Um, but it was it was beautiful. It was a beautiful movie. I I really enjoyed it, and I loved how each character was so different and so well played, like the butcher. Um, I can't remember the name of his character now, but the way that he, he was so subtle and so calm, but you could feel inside that he was like, Dara, what is happening? And exactly, I actually yes. enjoyed it, yeah. Beautiful. Yes, um, and, uh 
do you think that um, if, if a similar storyline were to become um, the basis of a Filipino film, it would work? I think so. I mean, I think it would work universally as long as, you know, of course, it's also, it also depends on how, how the director tells the story and how the act actors portray the, the, um, the characters. In fact, what, what I thought was interesting about this film was that, you know, I was thinking, this can't be, this can't be a thing. This is too much. This is a soap. I don't know. And then you realize in the end, it says, it tells you, this was based on true events. This, this, this really happened, you know? So then you kind of have to catch yourself and say, this isn't melodrama because it, happen to people this happens to people and i i assume it could happen to anybody around the world in any country because we're all humans good point and so um as annika pointed out um there are soapy elements so you expect it to kind of um um jump into you know the the deep waters as in um the the, the context itself as in um he, he rescues this, this woman who goes home with him before yeah. long. They're having a relationship. And of course, but he has that backstory where um, he cannot have sex. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's really so much going on. And, you know, um, when you think that you've seen everything, suddenly there's even a euthanasia theme. So it's so packed with incident. Yeah. So um, Monster, Monster, what did you think of the film? Um, I liked it enough, and I think that what I like about it is that when there are dysfunctional people and you try to make it work, I think that's the that's the heart of the film. Excuse me, I have to <laughs> excuse me. Go ahead. So, so uh, dysfunctional um, characters, but. <laughs> they come across as believable human beings, no? As in, um, there's so much going on in their lives, but yeah, they could uh, they could be people you know. Yeah, it's I'm I'm always fascinated with people who are messed up, and that's one of the things that when I was watching it, I realized that it reminded me a lot of Apocalypse. your own film, <laughs> our yes. own. Film. Yes. Um, for those who haven't seen it, Apocalypse Child is basically about a guy who's been told all his life that he's the son of Francis Ford Coppola. Yes. Okay, that's nothing to do with the Buena Estrella, but um, I guess the idea is that um, when you have a messed up life, uh, you bring that with you. And that becomes your story. And if that becomes your story, then, then that fucks up everything if you're just the son of a divorced parent or you're just the beaten up wife of someone's husband and you bring that with you and i'm sure annika's like yeah isn't that like what apocalypse child is right 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 but this time they make it work um this is about fucked up people who make it work who don't fuck up things and I think that's why it's a good movie in the end. Saves itself in the yes, because um, yeah. yeah, and because the the character of Jordi Moya, um, he uh, he and the character of Maribel Verdu, they they are raised in an orphanage. Um, they are told throughout their lives that they're only a certain way. They're used to rejection. No one ever. Um, adopted them out of the orphanage and it's very hard to escape from a background like that being told that you're only one way and so um they have the opportunity to uh to escape but it's more difficult than we think because they have too much baggage no yeah yeah and so um i'd like to ask um cookie because um the film was made in the 90s and it's set in the 90s, which is a period that you're also very familiar with since you lived in Spain for a long time. Um, what do you think of the, the, the whole milieu of the film? Okay, 
it's uh, you know it's a very interesting film, and I think I'm the oldest in this group, and I'm probably as old as their mothers. These two girls are probably old enough to be my children here. No, I'm so, ancient. I'm ancient. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm coming. For, I'm coming. I'm watching the movie, and I'm appreciating the movie from a different perspective. I think before we got on the air, I I, I posed a question, and that why is it that um, I I get. Uh, to relate to some, a lot of the, the issues when I watch a movie, I get to relate to the stories in the movie. And, and I think I've come to the realizations because I'm, I've, I've had a lot of experiences in life, no? And um, not that everything that happened in this movie happened to me, but you know, you can relate to, to people you've met, things you've read, places that, that you've lived in. So this movie for me is like, it's, it, for me, it's a love story in many fronts, okay? So it's a love story. It's people yearning for love in many different ways. Yes. Um, I, I, so I lived in Spain for a total of 11 years. So the first time I was there in 1990 when I was a scholar for the, with the, uh, the Diplomatic Academy. It was a, one of those grants that the Spanish embassy gave to young diplomats. So in 1990, I was a young diplomat. I think these two weren't born yet. But, um, um, and then I came back to Spain in 2002 until 2010, where I worked at the embassy. So I, I saw the difference. Um, in, in 1990, they had just, four years before that, they had joined the European Union. They were, you know, um, the eighth member, mm -hmm. I think, of the European Union. So, so Spain was opening to many things. And if you notice in the, in the movie, they were talking about peseta. So that right away, I, like, I remembered, I used to get my, my allowances in peseta. So, you know, a lot of these things, memories came back. I actually checked out online, you know, where this, where the, where they lived, um, the streets, because I could see on the, on the screen, the streets, you not know, like the bar, the butcher shop. So I, I went on Google Earth and, and right. searched for them. And unfortunately, the butcher shop's not there anymore. But beside the butcher shop, if you notice, there was like what's called a Ferreteria Labrador. So that, so, so you know, everything just, it, it was like going back in time for me. Um, I like, I think um, for us, um, the movie is very, it could be violent. Some people might find it violent, you no, know, because it did have violence. And also there were sex scenes, but, there were stories, there was a love, there were love stories, many love stories in there. And I think that was what really got me. Of course, I cried in some moments, no? Those were the moments that really hit me hard. But um, I, 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 for one, really enjoyed the movie very much, very, very much. Yes, and interesting that you described it as not a love story, but several love stories. Because yes, you know, it, it's got a, uh, it's got three people at its center, but they're, um, they have relationships with each other, as in, um, of course, you have the butcher who has the relationship with one eye, and then you have one eye who has a relationship with um, her, basically her only friend, the one she grew up with at the orphanage. And then, but then you also have the, relation, the, the burgeoning relationship between um, Jordi Moya's character and Antonio Resinias' butcher where um, despite their um, hostile beginnings, they actually become each other's family because, well, they have no one else. Yes. So um, uh, you, you mentioned earlier um, something about the priests and how um, when we see a priest on screen, we have an idea of what his role is. But the role of the priest in this movie is somewhat different to what Filipinos would expect. That's right. Um, it's interesting how if you see the reaction of Danny to Paco, the priest, no, but I'm almost rejecting it already in total. You know, he yes. grew up in an orphanage, which I, I imagine that orphanage was run by the religious. No? I think he said it, at yes. some point in the, pre, in, the, in the movie, he said that, you know, the nuns and all that. So you could see the first encounter with, of Danny and Paco in the butcher shop when he was finally hired by, uh, by Rafa to work. So you can see the exchange and the words that he used, he uses. In fact, even the expression, the curses of Danny, are very almost, I guess you can say anti-church. There's there's an expression that they say in Spain. It's um, well, not all of not everybody says it, but there are people who say it and 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 Danny has said it. It's uh, he says Ostia, 
Ostia, which means host. Okay, the, as in the oh. host. So that's mm -hmm. actually, it's, it's not because he's religious, it's actually the opposite, no? So he's using it. Uh, and then you would also see that at the end, when he dies, I mean, not he dies, but when he's already in his dying bed, all of a sudden he says, okay, fine, just come in and just do it, get it, get it out of the way and do it. So, you know, there's this thing. The where, last rites. Yeah. yeah, the last rites. Like he didn't believe it, but fine, go ahead. Maybe out of the kindness of, uh, because he saw Rafa, went did you know went the extra uh, did the extra effort to call Paco and the, the entire belief in 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 in, in, in well, you know, Catholic Catholicism so maybe in the end he accepted it but while he was healthy and doing his things while while he was healthy there was nothing he actually didn't believe in religion it was a total uh, detachment and it's uh, it's not only detachment but it's actually something that was he was so violently against yeah well actually I thought that was my favorite scene because in the beginning um, you would think that that's kind of offensive for for Danny uh, to be forced upon for the extreme action is that what you call it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yes. Yes. The, the last rites. Right. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, in the end, that was the ultimate friendship. Um, because you're right. It's not detachment. It's actually, um, it's almost yeah. like his final yeah. hatred yes. for the church. Uh, yes. He wasn't apathetic to it. He was against the church. So to let the priest do that to him. Um, just by Rafa saying, let him do his job, meant so much. Um, and I think that was, I don't think he was converted. Uh, in my mind, it was the friendship. It was the conversion of a true friendship. This is, okay, fine. Yeah. Oh, I, li I like that. I super like that. that. That was my favorite scene also. I think that was the, the scene that touched me the most. Because in the end... Yes, and um, so, I mean, that's our end. We, we oh, all, sorry, we all, uh, the all connection's all a little slow. Please continue. continue. Yeah. That's, that's our end. And then in the end, I guess, you know, everybody accepts it because there's nowhere else to go. You can't get out yeah. of it, so you accept it. And that's what Danny showed us. Yeah, 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 which I like because I didn't expect that the last turn will be from him. Um, it's just one of those things I thought when he returned home, or home, when he returned home, that was it. Um, so I guess that's what makes it not so melodrama in the end. Yes, and um, so we were talking about um, the role of the priest and, you know, the extreme unction. And I was thinking that, you know, there, there are many other, there are many reasons why Danny would agree to um, be administered, be ministered to by the priest um, in his last hours. As in, he could be doing it for Rafa and, um, what's the name of the woman? Uh, as in, you know, to... Marina. To, to, Marina. Yeah, to, to Rafa and Marina. Because, you know, um, as, a, as a sign of love. Because obviously they cared so much about him. And, you know, he wanted to give them a little peace. And it could also be, you know, um, because um, uh, even if... Um, Span uh, Spain is Spanish society is not as super Catholic as it used to be back in the time of the Inquisition. Um, it, it's still a cultural force. It's still a cultural force, as in you know that um, that line about there being no atheists in foxholes, as in um, in, in your in your last moments, as in it's probably best to hedge your bets. True. <gasps> yes. And so, um, uh, Annika, I wanted to ask Annika, because um, earlier we talked about how um, there, are, there are rather graphic sex scenes in this film. And, um, you know, uh, so, so, some of them just suddenly um, happen and they're, they're, they're a little surprising. And so I wanted to ask, as an actor who has figured in sex scenes in Philippine movies, how difficult would it have been to, to film something like that? 
Um, I think it's it's always difficult because it's such a it's so intimate. You know, sex scenes are scary to do. At least I find them scary to do, and it it requires a lot of trust. Um, so you know, it it it. it you, it depends. It depends on the set. Depends on the the script, and it also a big part of it is the, the 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 people that you're working with. But you know, when it comes to this film, I didn't find the personally. I didn't find the sex scenes ov overly graphic. I just um, they didn't. Oh they were, yeah, they didn't seem shocking to me. They seemed they seemed kind of like how people have sex. Which, which mm -hmm. is nice, you know, it wasn't too much. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it really depends, you know. I mean, I've done, I've done, I've done maybe, I would say of the, the intimate scenes that I've done, I've done two rather graphic ones and they were two completely different experiences. You know, um, I, you, you had asked me earlier if, if it's how it feels, if it's embarrassing. Um, and I guess it's, I guess maybe it could be, but I think it's because maybe here we, we don't talk about sex as much. We don't talk about sex or we don't treat sex the way that it should be. You know, it's always, it's always glammed up or it's, sexualized as opposed to two people physically bonding which is what i felt um the char characters were doing in the film i mean the relationship between the um marina and uh what's his uh, name she's rafa. not he's not her husband right he's rafa. her rafa. see rafa, rafa. No, no, no. They're, they're, living to, they're living together the, um, the, the 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 one who went to jail I mean, those, they, they oh, don't yes. have sex scenes. Yeah, they don't have sex scenes, but, you know, when she's ironing, he goes there and he grabs her and he just, he, that's, you know, she's not naked, but that's, that's hard to do. That's, you know, that requires a lot. And um, that's, that's one thing that I, that I liked about the, this movie. And, and what, what I like about a lot of European films is how they treat their, sex scenes or those moments that are like that yes where they emphasize more the emotional um the emotional violence rather than the physical violence but then right. um i guess because um i grew up watching um sex scenes in the Gallup movies which were always um presented as the high point of the film <laughs> i remember when i was a kid if you heard saxophone music in the background that meant that people were going to get it on so um i think in, in philippine cinema we have some pretty weird tropes related to to sex scenes so um yeah. monster yeah um monster, what particular elements in the film um stood out for you uh so the sex scenes was important i think especially this is a little off. Uh, I'm not sure if there are filmmakers who are watching now, but the first sex scene when he he fingers he fingers her by the stairs. By the stairs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, it, it felt like it happened too fast. Um, um, uh, of course, of course, the idea is that it had to feel immediate and just giggle. Um, there's no English word for that, but yes. it's like he had to, he had to just get it out of himself, out of his system. So I thought, um, I was a little put off until I saw the second, um, the second scene. And that was beautiful because I think like, for example, when we shot the sex scene with Annika before, I w it was just, it was a closed set. Um, and it's important to put actors in a very comfortable and safe place, um, especially here in the Philippines, because we don't like talking about sex. Uh, the director, who happens to be my partner, uh, we're also not married, so I live in Sin. 
just to point that out. <laughs> I don't know why I pointed that out. But anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, the idea is he was also uncomfortable because people felt uncomfortable, which makes every sex scene in the Philippines not nice. So yeah, um, but you know, um, for context. Um, when when I was growing up, I think this is a common experience. I say when you're growing up in Manila and you're watching TV with your parents and people on screen start kissing, it's deeply, deeply uncomfortable. And um, my my instinct is to get up and leave. It's like no, my parents are looking at this. <laughs> yeah. So right? um, no, but that yeah. that's true. I think the first scene um, that monster mentioned, guy, the one by the Stairs, diba? the staircase. That yes. was kinda like the first sex scene, if you could call it that. No, because Rafa was a butcher. It's a boring life to be a butcher, you know. Every day you're chopping. Yes. But the first scene, he actually, the first scene was, I think it's, there's this big market in Madrid that you go early in the morning. It's the biggest, uh, it's the biggest seafood market in the world next to, next to Japan, next to Tokyo. But yeah, it's, it's like, like a, a meat. Meat yeah, processing they have, meat, plant. they have meat, they have they have a meat section, they have a fruit section, they have a seafood section, which you have to get up really early in the morning because that's when you get the produce and everything you need for your store. So you have to go there very early in the morning. So can you imagine he does that every week? He goes there at four in the morning, gets the best cut, and brings it to the butcher shop. And then all of a sudden, okay, so he meets Marina, saves her, and then and then maybe that 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 thing in the stairs. Maybe that just showed how repressed Rafa was all these years, and maybe that's why he mm -hmm. he was he 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 was he, he he welcomed Marina or he was he he accepted Marina right away into his life. Like I'll help you, I'll help you out. I don't know what his idea was was to 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 find a girlfriend or what, but maybe in the kindness of his heart, he wanted to help a woman because he was lonely. I'm I'm not so sure. But going to the sex scenes, I think. There was, you know, even the one in the bathtub when, where Antonio Resines, he's well combed. It's not like his hair is disheveled. It was like well combed. And um, I remember going out with guys who look like him. And, and, and so it's, it's so, <laughs> it was clean. It was very clean. It's a clean shot. Um, they're in the bathtub together naked. And then there's yes. one scene in the bed where you have the back of Maribel Verdu and it looked like a painting or a, or a, it was like an artistic yes. um, shot. The Baparang, the nice curves of her body and you knew what it was. So you don't see penetration. You don't see, you know, it's just kissing. It's all that. It's very subtle, but you know, it's intense. Yeah. It's very intense. Yes. And I think that that's what's very nice yes. with, and with with European movies and, and, and well, the Spanish movies also. You're right, the Filipino movies sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, but usually the sex scene is something to invite people to watch because, oh, finally so-and-so is naked. Yes. And, uh, but it's you know, the there, hook. which we actually did, we had some films, naked films, I'm trying to remember it, that we showed here in, in, in Lisbon during the, the film festival, because we showed the three eras, golden eras of, uh, golden age, three golden ages of Philippine film. So there was a movie with, um, oh God, Coco Martin, where he works in a, I, I, I'm, I'm already, you know, I'm older than you guys, so I forget all these things. There's just so much information. Um, and, and there's a lot of frontal stuff. In fact, <laughs> It became the cover of the uh, film festival in Malaga. It was the it was the full frontal of Coco Martin. I remember I was assigned in Madrid then. And so for it's, me, it's I, was, I, was or I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. I'm the consul general there, and then I see this. You know, I think it was the Malaga Film Festival, and it's like the full frontal of Coco Martin. But you know, it's not you know, It's not seen as obscene or as porno. It's it's art, kasi. So I guess it, it depends it, on it, the it, words. That's that's the thing. As yeah. the Pinoy, you're the one who's embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. But to them, it's it's, it's normal. It's you know, normal. It's, it's no big deal. Yeah. 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 Even, and so, even, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Piece? Go ahead, so, go ahead. Even other movies, like if it's not if it's not porn, it's poverty. Sometimes we're so embarrassed to show poverty, right? But 
it's not that it's a fact of life and people accept it because they know that's not what you see every day in the philippines but we, we get so defensive when there's a little porn, not porn, a little nudity, a little thing about 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 uh, poverty, but then we feel so offended. But it's not the best shots of the Philippines. But no, it's it's art because there's a different appreciation, and people know they're watching a movie. It's not a documentary. It's a movie. So there are the director, the actor are trying to show something. I think that sometimes we forget about those things when we watch our films on screen too. Yes, um, and it's interesting that, that, that you brought up um, the very Pinoy thing where we always want to put our uh, best foot forward. It's, it's like we are constantly competing in a beauty contest where everyone has to give the correct answers and look perfect all the time but you know I, I i don't know why we expect this of ourselves but um anyway we were we were talking about um the, the role of sex in the film and it's interesting that um sex is not merely um a, a physical connection as portrayed in la buena estrella but it's more of a dramatization of the emotional bridges that are being built between um, the three characters. And so um, we talked about the, the scene on the stairs and I was thinking that since you have um, three very complicated, very very human characters, it could be not just that um, Rafa is, is bored with his life and looking for, for, for some company, some connection. It could also be that um, Marina is, um, first expressing her gratitude and also it could be that you know since she's a street smart person she's giving him reason to let her stay you know uh, she's uh, she's she's in a way using him but then their 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 relationship evolves so yeah. it becomes a genuine um uh it becomes a genuine emotional connection and not just her using him so um i think yeah. the film lends itself very well to to different interpretations of um, people's motivation. But, yeah, I think um, that's, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, please. Um, no, uh, that I think like, this is a perfectly functioning, dysfunctional mm -hmm. relationship because Rafa is an enabler, obviously. Um, he's, he's, born, he, he's born that way, I think. Um, I'm not sure if it was triggered or aggravated by the castration, but uh, someone coming in who really needs him, um, kind of like, parang it's, yes. it's, it's almost a lock. It's almost a lock. And, um, and of course, this is, uh, then there's this, I don't know if you call it a vicious cycle, or, but it's definitely a cycle when Danny comes in, who really obviously needs, um, What's her name? Marina, Marina. Who, is, who becomes an enabler when this abuser comes along. So it's, it's just this perfect circle of um, relationships of people who really, in the end, need each other. No one is better than the other. They just need to enable and then they just need to, um, they just need to use the other person. It's just, that's just the way it works. And we are all dysfunctional anyway. Iba ibang levels lang. The thing is, people like exactly. Rafa, and so, exist. I mean, people like Rafa, Marina, and Danny really exist in real life. Um, it's exaggerated in the film, but I, you know, those things have their their life their life stories are real. Yeah. Well, we're in the entertainment business, and I'm sure any. Yes, knows. I'm sure they do. <laughs> We no, we, we we live and breathe. I mean, I'm a dysfunctional person. I'm in a dysfunctional relationship. We just find ways to like make it, you know, you make right. it work. Right. I mean, when when I I didn't get the impression that that Marina was using um, Rafa. I I feel like they both found as like a symbiotic um, relationship where each each one could feed a need of the other and they were okay with that she 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 never told him that um uh, she didn't love um gosh the the guy who went to jail she was always 
honest about she was always always honest about how she felt how she 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 was she she, she wasn't worried about him she was worried about how she would react to him like she was yes all that was a very him. interesting scene where she said that she was more worried about herself right. than about um and yes right and i i i loved that about her character and i felt that it was for that reason that you couldn't hate her or or judge her because that's her life and that's you can't there are some things you just can't um help you know because he was the you know he was the only one that remembered her from her her old life from her childhood she was he was the only one that knew she had a um one eye you know what i mean and it it was um i thought they portrayed that so well and yeah, yeah. yes so um they're not just friends they're also allies in a mostly hostile world that is trying to crush them i guess and um so so that's one of the things that distinguishes la buena estrella from the usual melodrama in that it refuses to pass judgment on its characters as in right. the characters do things for which um they would be um condemned by society but they continue and they accept each other and you know acceptance is so rare in real life and it's it's beautifully portrayed in this film um monster what did you think of the cinematography the the, the editing and other aspects uh i think it opened very well i mean those those cows that were crowding and um especially the big scene yeah, yeah. Uh, why did it open why did it open with the the pictures of uh with, with the images of the, the cows being butchered i'm not sure but it felt like it was a crowd it, it felt like there was a lot of suffocation involved um so i thought for someone who's so neat and proper um he's a butcher i mean that's I, i have no cultural background whatsoever on what's going on in spain but that's what it felt like and it was good to establish the fact that people were nice to him uh someone sharpened his knife uh it's, yes, it's without his asking yeah, without his asking so okay this is a guy that people like uh nobody had to tell me that it's just he's someone who's uh that people like in town and then what's very telling is that at the inciting incident where he saves marina which was beautifully shot i thought because if you count the shots there weren't a lot it's just very simple deceptively simple it's not simple because it's a street uh it already showed that he was very brave uh he'd stand up for people i mean it's with and the words were so spare uh yes and, you know it's just but it's it's something i wish i'd like to see more in our cinema um so i the, I the economy that, of the economy <laughs> of the presentation you know yeah the i mean that was great and i don't know how franco did it but somehow um i didn't question why he would take in a total stranger uh that I mean, is why, true I never I, i never as in i never asked it uh because i was just watching yes, the because uh, yeah it's doesn't it that it it shouldn't make sense but i didn't question it therefore it does. therefore the acting was amazing yes and by yes. the end of the film i think you, you know it's obvious or it's clear or maybe it's, what i mean is by the end of it when you see all that shit that rafa went through you know and still he took it and he you know he i want to say he really respected this convict and let yes. him into your house leave him yes. with the woman that you love you don't lose i mean the control man and by the end of it it's it's kind of like of course he would just save somebody from this who's getting beat up on the street cuz that's 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 the kind of person he is i guess yeah 
yeah um but i think it's also the the enabler the enabler in him um i mean it's it's not i don't want to use the shrink talk but it's just that i feel like that's what makes it amazing as well that he has to accept it because he has to be this guy who yes who saves them and that's okay i mean to a fault but that's what makes it a movie yeah. Yes, and interesting that you brought that up because um, while I was watching it, um, at no point did I feel na, uh, because I often feel like yelling at the screen, but at no point did I feel like saying, Hoy Rafa, what the hell are you doing? Hindi mo kilala yung babae niya, and you left her into your house, and then her ex comes along, and you accept him, what the hell? And yet, you know, I remained silent. <laughs> <laughs> right. oh, I was yelling at the screen. I was going, Rafa, come on, man. Are you gonna are you gonna let him do that? Come on, man. But then as the <laughs> on, you're like, damn. I think Rafa knew what he wanted. Rafa wanted something and he saw the opportunity in Marina. Okay. So when he first met Marina, he wanted company. So I, I think he only at first wanted company, which he got through Marina. Then when we found out Marina was pregnant, he was happy because diba, he was always with that, that scene with his sister and the kids playing. Parang he's always wanted to have a family and the fact that he was castrated, his being you know, a man was already it's being... Not possible uh, for yeah, him. Not possible. And all of a sudden, parang hulog ng langit, here's this woman. I now have a girlfriend and I now have someone who I can give love to and hopefully will give me love. Then she turns out to be pregnant. But she has this extra baggage of her boyfriend, which, okay, I can't compete because, you know, he's full-bodied, I'm not, okay? And then, and then maybe the fact that, okay lang, if she gets pregnant again, well, then I'll have another kid. But and that's what he wanted. Eh? But he just wanted that affirmation. He could be a father, he could be, you know, he could be something else because he didn't, he couldn't. He couldn't be it on his own, but every but people around him, Marina and everybody else, like you said, enabled him to have that life that he really wanted to have. Imagine his best friend was the priest, okay? And so what does yes. the priest stand for? I mean, you know, family life, good life, you know, everything good and happy that should happen to you. And so finally, but it comes in, the, in, in, in Marina who isn't actually you know, who's not a virgin. I mean, she's, she's, she's damaged goods and comes to him. And yet, he cleans up everything. Yeah, he makes, he gives her a life. He gives her a new, a new, an opportunity to, to I guess to, he, he wants to offer something to Marina. At the same time, it's actually for him. It's, it's more for him than it is for Marina, I think. Yeah, so by saving her, he's also saving yeah. himself. Yeah. And, um, I, I, another thing I found interesting was the difference in acting styles between Antonio Resines and Jordi Moya, where um, Antonio, uh, Antonio Resines seems very stoic and yeah. quiet and interior, yeah. and while um, the character of Danny is more out there, as in bordering on hamminess, and he's more um, extroverted. You know, I, I have butchers. In, I lived in Spain for a long time, so. You know, on weekends, you go and buy your meat, your vegetables, your fish from the same guy. And my butcher is the same way. He's calm. You know, he's, he, you know he, he's calm because you have to have a respectable butcher, no? So he's, he's um, very, how do I say this? The, being a butcher, I guess the, why they chose the butcher is a butcher is a very serious person in, in the lives of the Spaniards because you get good meat from him. You don't go to a butcher shop if they don't shell, sell you good meat. You go to somebody else. So there, I say, you, when you buy meat, you usually buy from the same person, from your grandfather to you, to your children. And, and he also um, uh, hands, uh, hands the tradition to his children. And, um, and, and so I think that being the butcher, it's a lot of confidence in the, in the fact that he's a butcher, you know? Yes. His personality, it may be boring, but a butcher is a serious profession, and it's one where everybody in every society in Spain has contact with their butcher. And this is before everybody had the supermarkets. But right. up to now, people prefer buying their meats in the palenque with the butcher. 
They're all they're, they're yes. a traditional butcher. Not to mention that the choice of um, butcher as the profession. Of course, you know, butcher is an innately violent job because it um, it requires the killing of animals. So, um, so there is violence there somewhere in him. And uh, I found it interesting that, um, did they ever explain how he was accidentally castrated? That's, in, that's, that's not something that... Um, it was just an uh, accident. That often goes unremarked. Yeah, yeah. Yes. accident love. He just said that it accident. was an accident. Yeah. 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 And so... Um, there are a lot of questions here. Yes, um, let's, let's uh, go through some of the questions from the audience. Okay. Um, the, uh, from Christine Carlos, the character of Marina is very multi-layered. She is both Madonna and whore. So was Rafa's, a repressed Catholic bachelor whose bestie was the parish priest. How were women during this time in Spain? And does the Marina character reflect this? complexity. I guess this is a question for Ambassador Cookie. Okay, I have to be careful because I'm ambassador, right? But um, yeah, I lived in Spain in 1990 and for a year, the 91, and I came back in 2002 to 2012. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, it's, you know, and I actually, um, I grew up abroad. I spent 11 years. I left the Philippines when I was 18. I came back when I was 30, joined the foreign service. Three months later, I left for Spain, stayed there for another year, went back to Manila for, I don't know, a year and a half, then started my whole abroad thing. So if you're asking me, um, I've met a lot of people like that. And um, uh, I think it's not just in Spain. I think it's all over. Um, I think there's also a lot of Filipinas that way. But um, that, you know, we're both whore and Madonna um, because that's probably mm -hmm. the nature of our, our culture, our society. Uh, and we get brought up in, uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop because I might say something and uh, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll turn it over to Monster, from Cookie to Monster. <laughs> well, I, um, I don't Monster, know. Monster, yes. Sorry, uh, my, my, my connection's fading, yes. It's okay. Um, I don't know if you can articulate better, but I've always thought about this whore and Madonna complex because we're working on something now that's about sex positivity. I, I actually don't get the Madonna part of it, especially of uh, this particular character. Um, she's, she's damaged in the sense that she was I guess we say horror and Madonna all the time because it's it's more poetic and lyrical. But the more I've been studying women, the more I'm thinking, I she's not virtuous. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think that's why I like Marina so much because it's not even she's not even submitting to anybody. She's staying yes. focused. She has her agency, as we always yes. say these days. Yes. In fact, Rafa, and this is not supposed to work, is a very passive character. Um, the only thing that she, he has ever decided was to pick up Marina from the cudgels of Danny. And after that, things happen to him. And then, yes. um, at least that's how I look at it. And then after that, it's Marina's story forever. Right. And... Um, the story of Madonna. Basically, Marina makes her own decisions. Mm -hmm. All that, this, from, from minute one, from minute one, yes. she was doing her thing, except for the fact that she was saved by the guy. So I want to study more about the whole horror and Madonna complex because I think this is the start. Whoa, I, I'm sorry. Did I just offend anybody? <laughs> Thunder. <laughs> Thunder um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's interesting because it's a modern take on how women live now. It's 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 no longer a dichotomy. Oh, it's not. Oh, it, it, it's like Rafa was like the the canvas, and Marina was doing the painting all around. So without Rafa, Marina couldn't do her thing, 
right? So she was bad, and then she saw the opportunity to be normal, have a normal life, and she grabbed it because that was what she always wanted to to to, to have. I guess maybe that's the Madonna part in 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 all of us that we want to have something that's traditional, um, yeah. in 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 that sense. Yes. So. But uh, you're right, it became a marina have, story. Uh, Rafi, Rafa just was just the canvas for her to paint her life in the whole movie. And, and Danny was one of the colors in her life. It was, you know, it was that shocking. Danny was the guy story. that everybody had to save. As in, 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 um, in the movies, he, he plays, you know, the hapless heroine. <laughs> Except that, you know, he, he, he's a guy with a criminal record. So but you know, in the here end, we have another we have another question from the audience. Um, I think I wanted to say something. Go there. Yeah, I just Go wanted ahead. to say. Um, I just wanted to say that we also. I I I also wanted to point out that I don't think they're just working on each other because the thing that keeps them all connected and all together is Estrella, is the the the, the daughter, the whole time. Yes. So you know, I mean. We can we can argue that they that they started because um, Rafa was lonely and and you know she gave him um, a, a comfort and he gave her security. But also, I think she there, she also had to acknowledge the fact that no one else could take care of Estrella except for Rafa. He's the only one who could. You know, without him, she would may not be able to take care of her child. Is that True. good point because when she goes to join Danny, um, she leaves the child, uh, she leaves Estrella with him. She's perfectly right. comfortable in leaving the child with Rafa, right? I actually, so, um, seen, I hated the way that she ran away like that. I that to me might have been probably the most maybe melodramatic reaction that I that I felt in the movie, but but yeah, you know. I guess um, a lifetime of running to save Danny from whatever trouble he has gotten himself into again. But we have another question from the audience, from Trina. She's asking if one eye is a symbol. Because um, it reminds me of how um, early on when the, the, the people at the, at the meat packing plant sharpen his knives, I thought, is this some kind of Freudian thing, sharpening the knives? And then, you know, um, the one I, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, for me, the sharpening of the knife for me was just, um, just to show the familiarity of, of Rafa with his work. That was it, which happens. I mean, maybe it's superficial, but that's it. The one I think, I, I don't know. You, can, you have to ask this to artists. <laughs> Yes. So, um, questions from the audience. Um, hang on. I, I keep um, losing the, the questions. Um, from, um, we, have a, we have a comment from Teresa. She says, my favorite part would be when Marina said she didn't have orgasms whenever she was doing it with Danny. It put Danny and Rafa in contrast how they are the exact opposite. Danny being the more quote-unquote masculine one, and yet Rafa seemed to be the one who was giving her pleasure. Actually, question, didn't, didn't uh, Marina say that it happened to him, uh, it happened to her only once and it was the first time they did it or something? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. So that was that yeah, that is interesting that um I guess orgasm comes in various forms. It always doesn't have to be this very potent, very visceral type of um coming, so to speak. Yes, and you know, sex is a brain thing, so Anyway, um, and then another, um, another element that comes into play uh, in the film is the whole nature versus nurture debate because um, Marina and Danny both grow up within an institution where they are raised by, by, by nuns and priests and I suppose they did not get the sort of affection that most kids get growing up in their own home. So um, 
uh, going with that, the, the movie seems to suggest that, you know, um, they are products of their childhood. And so um, you really cannot blame them for turning out the, the, the way they did because this is all that they knew. What do you think? I think it's always a combination of both. Uh, childhood, it wasn't for the both of them, it wasn't just childhood. The problem with poverty is it carries on, it carried on with them until they got old. It wasn't like somebody took them out of, out of their, um, out of their rut uh, at the right time. They never had the opportunity and the only refuge they had was each other. So um, I'm not sure if nature versus nurture was uh, is is part of the discussion because it was both especially for 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 these two characters right um and so uh we're, we're almost out of time uh before we close um can we um go through uh, one by one um share our parting thoughts about the film um anika um well, I just want to say thank you for inviting me and to watch the film because I, I really did enjoy it. I thought the, um, you know, it was such a surprise for me to see the story of these characters and how each of them handled their situation. And I loved, I can't stop thinking about the line of the priest when he says, um, you ha when he says to Rafa, you have the look of a fresh sinner. Uh, you're still happy and glowing and you have no you know, have no care for the consequences i just i love that line i loved the bathroom scene i love just the way the 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 relationship between the two men and how that grew just so good and also i mean the bit that really got me actually was the end end after everything and how they they talked about how marina passed away because of what, what she yes was and it, it happened off screen oh my god and um, I mean, that you know. would have been you know in, in in a in an in the usual movie that would be like the big heavy pang award scene where you know um marina says goodbye to to rafa but they, they, they dealt with it almost in passing. It's like, oh, by the way, <laughs> she's no longer with us, which I found so, so, so brave of the movie, actually. And it was also kind of like a, a final point. Uh, was there any um, last thoughts? Um, yeah, so thanks for making me watch a movie and not have to talk about making movies. Uh, that's something that we, we're all still struggling with. Uh, so that excites me again. Uh, and what's mm -hmm. great about Spanish films is that we can relate to it so much in so many levels that you, of course, we, of course, everybody has a has a best friend who's a priest. Of course, we know someone who's a bachelor and cannot have kids. Um, these are all characters we can relate to, and. Um, so thanks for allowing us to watch it with a different light. And I think that's what one eye means. It's about a character who sees things in a different way. Mm. Um, I think, I'm not sure, but that's the easy, that's, that's a superficial symbol I can think of because we see in stereo, we see, we need, we have two eyes, but one eye gives you a different perspective of things and she has made us see that. So thanks. And I think Jessica froze. I think Jessica's frozen. So if we're still on the air, my last words is just, please continue watching and keep on watching foreign films because foreign films really enriches you. Uh, we see, not only do we travel through films, so we learn a lot uh, about ourselves also. Sometimes we can project ourselves through the foreign, through the, through the, through the movie, through the film, through the script. Uh, but I think more than anything, we learn a lot. And um, um, I just like to encourage people to keep watching foreign films. And Spanish films are one of the best in the world. So thank you to Instituto Cervantes for, for giving this opportunity for us in the Philippines, for the Filipinos to watch um, more, foreign, more Spanish films 
quality Spanish films. Yes. Um, sorry, my, my internet connection is, is beginning to fail me. You're going around. You're going around. Yes, I know. It's like you're going around. But thanks very much for joining us. And um, I'd like to invite the audience to watch the next film um, in, the, in the next weekend. It's a comedy for a change. It's called La Bajia by um, Luis Berlanga. And um, thanks very much to our guests, um, Annika, and then to Monster and to Ambassador Cookie. And so um, if you haven't seen uh, La Buena Estrella yet, it is on until two in the morning. You have to be over 18 to watch it, as you may have guessed from listening to our discussion. So um, we'll see you again next week, I hope. And maraming salamat po.